Um, which will be from uh, Lydian Boschman, who's a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich. Um, she did her PhD at Utrecht University, and she's an expert in paleogeography with a particular focus on seeking to reconstruct the motion of subducted, uh, subducted ocean plates, which she's going to be talking to us today using examples from Japan, New Zealand, Mexico, and Costa Rica. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Uh, are my slides visible? Yep, they look great. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity uh, to present uh, some of my work here. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about reconstructing plate motions of uh, subducted plates, so plates that do not um, exist on the surface of the Earth today anymore. Uh, using paleomagnetic data from subduction complexes. And uh, indeed, I'm at, uh, at ETH in Zurich right now, but this is my PhD work that I did at Utrecht University. So this is in collaboration with people from Utrecht, Dau van Hinsbergen, Cor and um, also people from elsewhere, you can see on the slide. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of a general introduction on plate tectonic reconstructions. This is probably not uh, new for most of you, but just a small recap. So on the left here, you see uh, a map of the, uh, the ocean floor um, with the colors representing the ages. And on the right is a drawing of um, ocean floor forming at a mid-ocean ridge and storing the direction of the Earth's magnetic field while it cools and while it moves away from the ridge, forming a barcode uh, of marine magnetic anomalies that give us the ages of the ocean floor. Um, uh, symmetrical, a uh, symmetrical pattern on, on both sides of, of the ridges. And using that uh, pattern of marine magnetic anomalies uh, of, of our oceans, we can make reconstructions of the plate motions of the continents. And this is a, uh, uh, our figures from, from a reconstruction of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so by putting the marine magnetic anomalies together on both sides, of, both sides of the ridge, placing them back to their position of origin, you move the continents uh, back to the pre-opening position of the ocean. And in this case, you see that you end up with a fit of North America, South America, and Africa in its uh, Pangea configuration. Um, so I already mentioned um, uh, the map here uh, with the colors, so the red and the green colors uh, and the yellow um, are all relatively young ocean floor, basically late Cretaceous and Cenozoic. Um, and considering the, the age of, of the Earth or the age of the continents, that is all relatively young. Um, there's only a couple bits that are older, Jurassic, uh, the blue and the, and the, and the purple colors. Um, and what that means is that we can use this method only for relatively recent uh, times. So maximum 200 million years ago, and th that's really about it. Um, so we do have reconstructions that go further back in time. Here we see on the, on the top uh, 480 or division or 750 MA. Um, and in these figures, you see the configuration of the continents. Um, and these reconstructions are purely based on data from the continent. So that's primary uh, paleomagnetic data, but also final data or, or orogenic belts and um, the result is that we have a reconstruction of the continental fragments, but not of the oceans. So we have some plate boundaries between the continents, uh, sometimes directly adjacent to the continents, but the rest of the oceanic domains are basically empty. We don't know anything about the plate motions, plate configurations, uh, anything that went on there. Now you might ask, why is it relevant to know what, what the plate boundaries look like and the plate motions look like? in the deep past because these plates don't exist anymore. Um, and there's a lot of answers to that, to that question, but um, one, uh, there's there are basically two fields that I'd like uh, to highlight that, that benefit from knowing these motions. And the first is geodynamics. So in modeling long wavelength mental convection or in the calculation of, of true polar wonder or net spheric rotation, um, what you need is a, a model of all plate motions of all the plates on the Earth. So here we see a figure of uh, Steinberger and Torschwick. Um, they calculated a phase of Cretaceous uh, true polar wonder, and they used the motions of all the continental plates and not of the oceanic plates, not because they, those are irrelevant, but because we simply don't know them well enough. Um, and, and the result is that you basically miss out on half, half of the planet, which is really quite, quite a lot. Um, the second field, or actually a whole uh, collection of, of fields, um, is all research in which outcrops are used of marine deposits 
um, which provide information on the condition of former oceans, basically. So for example, here we see um, a photograph of Triassic coral fossils that are exposed in the Canadian Cordillera um, today at 55 degrees north. Um, and these fossils may give all kinds of interesting information on the environment in the ocean uh, in which they lived. Uh, but that was most likely not at 55 degrees north. Um, so to be able to use uh, this particular outcrop of fossils to get information about conditions of our Triassic oceans, it's important to know where these fossils formed. And uh, to do so, we need to know the plate motion of the plate, which was in this case, probably the Farallon plate that brought them to where they are today in Canada. Um, and this is true for all kinds of marine archives, not only fossils, but deposits of oceanic uh, anoxic events or sediments that can provide information about climatic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, besides, uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, so in my uh, PhD project, I focused on the Pantalesa Ocean, which is the uh, ocean that was surrounding Pangaea. So this is uh, late Paleozoic, early Mesozoic. Um, Pangaea was formed within Pangaea. We had the Tethys Ocean and around Pangaea, so the external ocean, we had the Pantalesa Ocean. Um, and the modern Pacific is the remnant of that Pantalas Ocean. And even though it is the largest ocean that we have still today, um, it's considerably smaller than what the Pantalas Ocean was back then. As you can see on the map, uh, the Pacific is almost entirely um, surrounded by subduction zones, except for the passive margin of Antarctica. Um, but that passive margin um, did not exist before approximately 83 million years ago. It was a subduction zone before that time as well. So in Pantalesa times, but you can also see it here on the left, um, Pantalesa was entirely uh, surrounded by subduction zones. And those subduction zones, of course, subducted oceanic lithosphere of the plates um, that were there then, but not anymore. So again, I, uh, I'm showing the marine magnetic anomalies here of the Pacific um, with the, the colors representing the age. So we have the East Pacific rise with young lithosphere on both sides uh, in red. And then in the Northwest of the, of the Pacific, uh, we have older lithosphere in green and blue colors with the center of this triangle um, uh, of 190 million years old approximately. So if we zoom in a little bit on those uh, marine magnetic anomalies, we see that we have anomalies in three different orientations, meaning that the early Pacific plate was surrounded by three uh, other plates uh, and, and bordered by, by ridges on, on three sides. So in the Northeast, we had the Farallon plate, the Northwest, the Izanagi plate, and in the South, the Phoenix plate. And indeed in, in um, many global plate tectonic reconstructions, this is Seton, for example, um, this is what that looks like. So we have the early uh, and, and small Pacific plate surrounded by Farallon, Izanagi, and Phoenix. Now this record brings us back to 190, but not to further back. Um, but still in, in most of the reconstructions, um, it is assumed that these plates existed uh, even before uh, 190, but then they came together in a triple junction um, and there were three spreading ridges between these three plates and subduction zones all around them. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is conceptual. We don't have any marine magnetic anomaly records uh, knowing this, so this is basically sort of a, a best guess. Um, however, there's uh, evidence that suggests that this is actually too simple. And, and one of the lines of evidence comes from seismic tomography. So this is uh, von der Meer, 2012. Um, they studied the lower mantle below the Pacific and they identified this large, roughly north-south trending anomaly, which they interpreted as the remnants of a large intrapantalassa subduction zone, which is drawn here uh, in the lower image. And they uh, named this the Telkinia subduction zone. So this is just one line of evidence suggesting that this is too simple. So besides marine magnetic anomaly uh, records, there is something else in the, in the geological record that can give us information about the history of subducted oceanic plates. And those are found in accretionary complexes in the subduction zones um, around the Pacific. So here's a simple drawing of a subduction system with the arc, fore arc, and a subducting plate. And at the trench, we have an accretionary prism or an accretionary complex consisting of uh, thrust lysis. And such an accretionary complex consists mostly of upper plate material. So erosional material from the arc, from the forearc that ends up at the trench. But 
um, there's often also a bit of downgoing plate material um, in such a complex. And uh, these downgoing plate materials, so they are scraped off the subducting plate, accreted to the overriding plate, and thereby basically saved from subduction um, and left at the surface. And these materials are called ocean plate stratigraphy, or OPS. And um, in their most complete form, they consist of a magmatic basement, pillow basalts, sometimes even uh, dikes or gabbros, but uh, most of the time only pillows. Then radiolarian cherts, so deep marine pelagic uh, siliceous sediments, sometimes limestones, depending on water depth and the CCD. Um, and then the further we get to the top of such an OPS sequence, the coarser grain the material gets. So we get hemipelagic mudstones, sometimes tophaceous mudstones, and then turbiditic trench fill deposits. So these, these turbidites are, are basically the, the material from the overriding plate and all of the rest represents um, the rocks that are formed on an oceanic plate during its journey from the ridge to the trench. So we start at the ridge forming the, the basement, then uh, deposition of deep marine uh, materials far away from a continental margin. And then the more we approach the trench, um, we get these hemipelagic mudstones and then turbidites. So these OPS sequences, sometimes you find entire sequences, sometimes only blocks in a melange. Um, they give tremendous uh, amounts of information about the tectonic history of these subducted plates. The basement is um, sometimes more mid ocean rich basalt, so that's the actual lithospheric basement of, of the plate. But more often, um, it is ocean island basalt or arc. And this makes sense because if an oceanic plate has seamounts or ridges or rises or anything irregular, then those will be uh, the bits and pieces that get scraped off and end up in the, in the complex, whereas the flat abyssal plane will subduct uh, much more easily. Um, so the age of the underlying basement gives us the age of the plate. Uh, in the case of more basement, the actual age, and in the case of something else, OIB or ARC, it gives you a minimum age because you know that an ARC must have formed on top of um, an older uh, litspheric basement. Um, the turbinates, or the top of the sequence, represents the age of accretion. And that means that the age difference between the base and the top of an OPS sequence is the age difference, uh, yeah, the age difference is the age um, of the oceanic plate during accretion. And um, that helps a lot in making these tectonic reconstructions. Now, it gets even better if we can get paleo latitudes, and that we can do, of course, uh, with paleomagnetism. Um, so in my project, um, we identified uh, four regions that you see here uh, that expose uh, accretionary complexes with these OPS sequences uh, that we sampled. So we have the uh, northern island of Japan, Hokkaido, uh, Cedros Island, which is uh, an island offshore of Baja California in Mexico, uh, the Santa Elena Peninsula of northern Costa Rica, and then a whole bunch of locations along the northern island of uh, north coast of the north island of New Zealand. Um, there are multiple reasons that we picked these locations. And um, the first is that uh, it's a bit obvious, but that these are locations with accretionary complexes. And that is not the case everywhere. The uh, trench of uh, South America, for example, has been erosional for at least its Cenozoic history. And there's no accretionary record anywhere. Um, so it's just nothing to get there. Second, um, from these four regions, four regions, we have a relatively good idea of what is happening in terms of tectonics in the overriding plate of these systems. So I described how you can use these OPS um, sequences to uh, get information on tectonic history of the downgoing plate, but then you do need to know exactly where this material accreted uh, at the overriding plate. And so I'm not going to say that it is straightforward or simple, the tectonic history of these regions, um, but we have uh, at least a relatively good idea. And, and actually, I spend the bulk of my time and also the bulk of the sampling um, on these overriding plate systems. So the back arc, the fore arc, the arc. But that's something I won't be talking about today. Um, to compare, for example, the, the northern, uh, northern parts of North America Cordillera, there's evidence for very large uh, trench parallel motions which complicates things quite a bit. 
and also um, Southeast Asia is, is the region of interaction with the Tethys Ocean, which, which also makes things a whole lot uh, more complicated. So we deliberately avoided these regions and, and that's why we chose these four. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of the different locations and all the sampling and data, but I wanna highlight a few starting with, oh yeah, I should say that the locations with the two letter codes are my own sampling locations and I included uh, three more um, where sampling was already done and, and data was published. So two regions in Japan and then Waiheka Island here in New Zealand. So the first one I wanna highlight is actually the Inuyama region in Japan, which is not one of my own sampling locations, but this is the uh, type locality of OPS. So this is where it was first defined and described in this way, in this context. Um, so this is a beautiful section of Triassic Church and um, there was a lot of paleomag done already um, with very high quality data sets um, uh, with uh, full tests, reversal tests, uh, so high quality stuff. Um, and I summarized it in this graph here on the right uh, in terms of paleo latitude um, and then age here on the x-axis. So we see a very clear northward motion of this particular piece of ocean floor. Uh, starting at the southern hemisphere and then crossing the equator, ending up um, at 200 million years at 30 degrees north. So good data set, uh, was no need to go back there. Um, some of the sampling I did myself was on Cedros Island, which exposes a serpentinite matrix melange. Uh, you can see here these beautiful silvery colors uh, from the serpentinite. And in the melange, there were lots of blocks of OPS. And one of these blocks, which is uh, CC1 on this little map, was a Triassic uh, sequence of chert um, that we sampled that was actually underlain by pillar basalts, but as you can see, they don't look particularly happy. So we didn't bother sampling those, but um, th th this was the lowermost uh, section of the OPS, basically that was what we uh, knew from that. Um, Cherts are a nightmare to sample. They are very hard, so you cannot drill them in the field. So you take hand samples and you uh, put them in your uh, backpack, bring them back home to the lab, and then you drill them um, later on. This is uh, the Santa Elena um, Peninsula, which exposes the Santa Rosa accretionary complex, um, which is a sequence of OPS that uh, has 190 uh, cherts at the base and goes all the way to 110. So it is a continuous sequence with different ages um, in it that we sampled again cherts. And uh, the last one I want to highlight is uh, the Okunikapu complex on Hokkaido. And this was actually the number one uh, target of this whole project. And the reason for that is that the magmatic basement of this complex is ARC. So it has a geochemical ARC signature. And um, so here we have a, a remnant of an ARC in the accretionary complex, um, which is of course something that could be linked to that Tokini acid production system that I showed earlier on. So these are variation charts. Uh, the magmatic basement is not dated, but uh, should be older than that. And we sample both the basement, as you can see here, and, and the charts again. Okay, some results. Um, I'm going to start out by saying that this is high risk sampling. I mean, these are rocks in, in, in the Christianary complexes. They're deformed, they've been buried. Um, uh, so in the end, 90% of all the samples that we took from OPS materials turn out to be remagnetized. 10% uh, we interpreted as potentially primary, and I say potentially because sometimes we could strengthen that interpretation with full test or reversal test, but not always. In many cases, it was actually only um, that we found multi-component behavior whereby we inter interpreted the lower temperature component as an overprint, and then a uh, component which was often hematite, of course, the pretty red shirts. So above uh, six, 600 degrees was uh, the component that we uh, interpreted as potentially primary. But yeah, I mean, 10% is uh, pretty disappointing, of course, but it's, it's also uh, kind of to be expected from works like this. So I'm going to start with some results from Mexico. So these are remnants of the Farallon plate. Um, we sampled two blocks of charts. That uh, CC1 block that I showed a photograph of was actually sampled before uh, by Huxley and Setlock. Um, they found a um, high temperature component that we actually didn't. So that was really disappointing. We did find two overlapping components. So we interpreted great circles um, uh, and we combined our data sets 
uh, the second block of chart had a very similar uh, signal. So we could um, get a paleo latitude from that of two, uh, three degrees um, for the upper Triassic. And these charts secreted uh, in mid-Cretaceous time at 32 degrees north. So what we get from this is uh, a northward motion of 30 degrees between the Triassic and the mid-Cretaceous. Next for uh, the Santa Rosa creationary complex, this is that sequence from 190 to 110. Um, the 110 were a very nice data set with a positive fault test, so we're happy about that. The 190 slightly less uh, pretty. Uh, we got two paleo latitudes. Um, so these charts secreted at 100 million years, at 11 degrees north, and the 110 charts gave paleo latitudes of a plus or minus 13 degrees. The 190 um, eight degrees, so all very similar. Uh, and, I, and I want to mention here that we don't know hemispheric origin here, especially not this close to the equator. So it's quite likely that the 110 charts were northern hemisphere, since they accreted 10 million years later at 11 degrees north, but for, especially for the 190, we don't know. Then uh, New Zealand, so Phoenix plate remnants. Um, New Zealand is a bit of a nightmare when it comes to paleomagnetism of anything older than late Cretaceous. There has been a major remagnetization event affecting the entire island. Um, so uh, in most or almost all of our, our sampled uh, sections, we found very clear, very pretty uh, overprint of that late Cretaceous um, uh, remagnetization. Um, except for in three blocks of charts. And um, uh, those are the three you can see here. Um, I'm, I'm calling these potentially primary because there were no faults, no reversals. So this is uh, uh, very much not a great data set. New Zealand was, um, yeah, disappointing basically. Um, we got a paleo latitude of uh, 11 degrees from these, and these three blocks, these charts accreted at 150 million years ago at 80 degrees south. So this is a massive uh, southward motion of the Phoenix plate. Um, we could use one additional result from uh, Kodama. Um, I was sampled a single chert layer and he did get a positive re reversal test. So that's uh, good news uh, with a paleo latitude of 33 degrees south. Uh, then last, um, the Izanagi plate remnants uh, results from Japan. So I already showed this graph with um, the results from the Inuyama region. Um, Second, we had results from Kirschwing study uh, from Kamura limestones, um, which gave a paleo latitude of 12 degrees south. And that southern hemisphere is uh, here based on a correlation with the polarity time scale. So that is actually certain. And these limestones accreted at 160 at 34 degrees north. So again, quite a bit of a latitudinal motion between. And then last, um, the Okunikapu arc, uh, our prime target. The magmatic basement was unfortunately completely useless um, and most of the charts were as well, uh, but we had one chert site where we found a higher temperature component than we did than we found in all the other charts um, and the lower temperature component had a negative full test um, and this one uh, was uh, not to be well indeterminate, but at least we did find a high temperature component that we again um, interpreted as potentially primary. And we really uh, wanted to go back to this, get more from this side and around this side. Um, but as you know, fieldwork has not been very easy recently. So hopefully we'll be able to get more data from this arc. It's such an important uh, location to get more data from. But for now we have to uh, deal with uh, this result uh, with a low uh, period latitude, equatorial 3.6 degrees. Um, yeah, and these charts are created in mid Cretaceous. So then I go straight to the reconstruction. So I compiled all the paleo latitudes. Um, I added paleo latitudes from an ODP side of um, in the Pacific, uh, Jurassic results from that uh, site. And I made a G place reconstruction of which you can see here for um, snapshots 140, 180, 220, and 260. And um, you may say this doesn't look very different from that Seton uh, figure that I showed in the very beginning, which is absolutely true, uh, except for this bit of interoceanic uh, subduction that we uh, included in the, in the Izanagi domain. But I would say that there is one very major difference, and that is that these plate, plates and plate motions are actually based on data, and that's a first. 
And um, it shows that it is possible to make reconstructions of, of oceanic plates that are no longer there. I uh, very deliberately left some bits open. Um, I mean, I could have filled it in, but that is the opposite of what the goal of this project was. Um, so these are regions that we need more data from and maybe we'll be able to fill them in later. Um, so some takeaways, it is possible to make uh, quantitative reconstructions of subducted oceanic plates based on data. Um, the uncertainty of the reconstruction is surprisingly small. And what I mean by that is that there was actually not that much freedom to move the plates around. So even though the, the error bars of, of the individual paleo latitudes that we determined was sometimes quite large, because we have enough tie points, um, it was basically, yeah, just not, not that much uh, room to, to move these plates around other than what you see in this reconstruction. Um, and um, besides the paleo latitudes, we also have, uh, we know that there must have been subduction at, at the margins. We know that there must have been divergence between these plates. Um, so all in all, that's, that's more than enough tie points to make a reconstruction that is really relatively certain. Um, last point. This is preliminary. Um, it does not cover the entire Pantalassa Ocean. Uh, what we need for that is more data from accretionary complexes, but also a better understanding of the plate motions and the overriding plates of the complex regions that we uh, deliberately left open. And um, I want to uh, end with saying that this is a method that I used to reconstruct Pantalassa plate motions, but of course it can be used to reconstruct the motions of any subducted oceanic plates. Um, as long as we have a record of OPS available. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Lydian. Um, I'll also give a quick plug. Lydian has some materials for uh, sort of G-Plates tutorials that include YouTube videos online. So if, you, if you're someone who thinks that sort of playing around with plate construct reconstructions yourself, there's lots of uh, uh, tutorials available, including those by this sort of G-Plates product, but Lydian's made some nice curriculum materials for labs, and you can find her explaining how to make reconstructions like these uh, on, on YouTube. Um, so yeah, again, for questions, we have, we have, a, little, we have a little over 10, 10 minutes, um, so you can raise your hand, type in the chat, or just be bold and uh, un, unmute yourself. Um, I mean, I'll just ask one to get to get started. And I had a question about how you sort of presented data giving the paleo latitude for deposition, say, of these chirps, and then asserted the paleo latitude of accretion at a given time. And I think I sort of missed where that came from. So, that, you know, for Cedros Island, you said it accreted at 32 degrees. Is that model based on the overriding plate? In particular, I'm thinking in the context of, say, this recently published Clenet model, which it doesn't have here, where the sort of idea that things are accreting is offshore archipelagos, and there's a more complex history of accretion, particularly in Western North America. Yeah. That's a very good question. No, the accretion ages are based on the, the top of the OPS. So um, the, the, the age of the turbiditic rocks that are in sequence with the church. Uh, and they represent um, sort of the last stage of formation of that OPS sequence just before they arrive at the trench and, and get subducted. So those ages are actually relatively certain. Um, these accretionary complexes are like, I don't know, 99% uh, of that trenchful deposit. So we have pretty good ages on that. Uh, much better ages um, on, the, on the trench field, the turbidites than we have on, on the base. And, and, and con uh, concerning the planet model, I mean, that's indeed exactly what I said. We, we need to have a pretty good idea of what's going on in the overriding plate for these records to become useful. And if we don't, if there's controversy about interoceanic subduction or continental margin subduction, then it's actually very hard to, to, to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so why we left out the North American Cordillera. Yeah. 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 So, so in terms of, I guess that answered the sort of age, you know, in terms of getting these maximum depositional ages in the turbidite sequence. And in terms of the paleo latitude, like when you're asserting 32 degrees for Cedros Island, that's that's based on the plate, the plate model at a given age, sort of assuming accretion like in place effectively on the kind of yeah. margin. So. Yeah. So we reconstruct the, the position of the trench. Um, in, for Cedars Island um, in Mexico, there has been a Beckard Basin opening uh, and closing in the Jurassic Cretaceous. Um, but in terms of paleo latitude, that didn't do much to the trench. 
um, mostly longitude. Uh, and then we use just a global like Torsvik or, or Seton model uh, to get the position of North America through time, basically. So that's where we get that 32 degrees north from. Do you, do you think there's room for some progress in terms of the the remagnetizations and their their data associated with accretion or is tilt correction just ends up being so uncertain that that's hard to see a pathway yeah for? exactly yeah um these rocks have been could i mean they could potentially have been like rotated seven times right so <laughs> if we find an original signal then we can do a tilt correction and we know for sure what the like the initial rotation must have been but it's very very difficult to use remagnetized signals because we just don't know where it was at the time of remagnetization or in which position yeah other questions out there for well so i i just wanted to say thank you uh lydian for for all your work um anita and i were recently working on the costa rica uh, outcrops and I saw your holes when you were sampling there, driving by in a boat. It was uh, pretty cool, and uh, we've already cited your work. Um, I, I, it's not been reviewed or accepted, but maybe it will be someday. All oh, right. Um, it it turned out to be really very valuable to know the paleo latitude of the the ophiolite in Costa Rica. Yeah. Cool. No, good to hear. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> Take me with you next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could uh, make a comment later on the uh, notice many of the charts were overlying basement, and that's uh, the oceanic basement. And that seems uh, it's kind of an unusual occurrence. You expect the sedimentary deposition to be above the carbonate compensation depth when the ocean floor is the shallowest. And so the place where you might expect to get uh, chert or siliceous sediments that become chert would be in upwelling zone. So in an open ocean, those might be along the equator. And uh, that seems to correspond to the low paleo latitudes you have observed in the, uh, in the, in the stuff that works. So, if you would assume you had all the charts were plus or minus say five degrees of the equator and just look at charts distributions in general would that uh, materially change the interpretation you've made no it wouldn't no and it's actually something we thought about i mean finding church in general gives an indication that most likely these are from equatorial latitudes yep. uh, derived from um we did not want to make that assumption um because I don't know, maybe the, the oceans in the Triassic were, were different. Um, but it is actually something like for a first order reconstruction that you can easily use. Uh, just assume that, that the charts, wherever you find them now, must have been derived from somewhere close to the equator. Yeah. I know there's, uh, there's some Hagstrom data from the coast range of in California where there's charts at around 30 degrees um, yeah. north, I think. So I was, I was just reading a Hobson paper, there's unpublished data on pillows that are argued to be equatorial and an argument that there's a significant um, missing time with an unconformity between the pillows and the church there. Hobson argues that uh, just because you know where the man, where a man put on his hat, you don't know where the man was born, um, which anyway, I thought was a nice turn of phrase. Um, but, it, uh, but, but anyway, I guess that just bears uh, yeah, yeah, I did do some study on the coast range over life, but this was a couple of years back, so I don't really quite remember. The idea that I had, at least from the paleo map work that has been done, it's all quite old and don't think there's any recent um, work. The idea yeah, there's basically there's a there's unpublished data in some master species that gets um, that gets cited um, as giving low low latitudes. Um, yeah. But um, but then but then there's data that's uh, more recent than Hagstrom did that is more more moderate latitudes, but it's not from the pillows, it's from the charts. Okay. Well, the North Atlantic charts that are mid-latitude is in the Eocene. And of course, uh, the way you see them is more or less where they were deposited. But the I think the issue there is whether the 
uh, whether those are radiolarian or diatomaceous, or could they be, uh, I mean, the silica has to get come out of the seawater one way or the other. It's a short residence time. So it, it may be uh, some funny mineral that essentially a, a clay that comes out if there's enough silica that's being brought into the system. So those might be higher latitude uh, church. And the, the, I think the issue is whether the uh, precursor was radiolarian, abiotic, so that, or diatomaceous, where upwelling, you have to have nutrients come up to let them uh, prosper. And that's in the Atlantic, you said? Well, the North Atlantic has uh, Eocene shirts uh, at uh, mid latitudes. Right. I mean, there's a, something called seismic reflector, A double prime, and so forth. Okay. They've been drilled. Are, are there many, you sort of, uh, in your, I guess it was your Cedros Island example, uh, pointed to the, the, how altered the pillows are. I mean, are, are there examples where there's been successfully targeted um, uh, pillows in the ocean plate stratigraphy and these accreted complexes sort of in the panthalassus realm? Yeah, I'm trying to think of what, um, not that I know of, we didn't try. Um, we, we could have tried in New Zealand maybe, um, but then we had a section of pillows that was not connected to church. So. Um, yeah, not that I know of, actually, no. Yeah, because again, I was, yeah, I was just looking at some data not too far from uh, here in the Franciscan accretionary complex, but anyway, there's some data that's published, but it was been previously, but then Hagstrom argued it was uh, re remagnetized just on the basis of it being single polarity. It like passes a fold test, but it could be, again, as you've said, these complicated deformational histories, you could pass a fold test and still be single polarity. 